Thanks so much, Rich. I'm, I'm intimidated now. Um, I'm inspired by Senator Collins and intimidated that my form, former congressperson, Connie Morella, is in the audience. So sorry. But I hope I don't do anything to embarrass our district uh, today. Thank you. Um, there are, I, I mentioned that I'm going to try and provide some continuity, and there, there is much in, in Senator Collins' speech that um, I, I, I trust is going to appear throughout the day in, in a lot of what you'll see in here and, and, and what we'll see in here from you as, as well as I become a kind of continuing rapporteur. Our first panel is called Inspiring Excellence in the Arts and Media. And um, we have James Kuno, the president and CEO of the J. Paul Getty Trust, Gregory Moore, the editor of the Denver Post, who um, went to, well, Dr. Kuno went to uh, Will Willamette University. And uh, I mention this because Gregory Moore, it says here, went to Ohio Wesleyan University and cheek by jowl with Kenyon College where, where, but wait a minute, there are only two people up there, no? <laughs> oh. Greg? <laughs> but most important uh, to me is my friend and colleague, from, my ex-colleague from NPR, uh, the education correspondent, Claudio Sanchez, who, uh, especially if you heard him on the air last week, knows a thing or two about looking for colleges, and uh, if you're, if you might share some of that experience with us. So is that Greg? Yes, Here he is. Thank you. So inspiring excellence in, art, in media. Welcome all, and thank you all for this invitation. Um, for the record, uh, let me just say that higher education is not my beat, but obviously as part of our education coverage, I do cover my share of higher ed stories. And also for the record, or in the interest of full disclosure, um, our daughter, Bianca, is attending uh, Bates. It's her senior year. And if there's anyone from Bates, the check is in the mail. <laughs> so let me provide a little bit of context for this conversation. And we do want to turn it into conversation. We'll allow for some generous uh, time for Q&A. Um, but you know, if you look at the headlines, I mean, here's what you come away with. And we all know that often reality is perception. Or is that the way the, around? Let me see. It's uh, perception as reality. Liberal arts colleges are an endangered species. The number that will shut down will be, will be much larger in the next 30 years than in the previous 30 years. A more dire prediction from Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, up to half may fail in the next 15 years. The analysis, a new disruptive economic model for higher ed is on the horizon. Whether you call them MOOCs or something else, the pricing and delivery of a college education is changing dramatically. Finances of liberal arts colleges are unsustainable. It's worth noting that when Howard Bowen, an economist and former president of Grinnell College, said that, the average tuition at private institutions was about $3,000. So there's a growing perception among average Americans that for all its promise, higher education is on a slippery slope. Access and affordability are more at risk than ever. Is college a lousy investment? That was the recent Newswit cover story. And it's not just the basic economic model that's under threat. It's the educational mission of your institutions that's being questioned. Does a college education have anything to do with the real world? Maybe we need a college, no student, a, 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 a college student left behind law. Yeah, that's it. Maybe with the federal government really breathing down your necks, threatening to pull its funding, maybe, maybe then you'd shape up. Well, guess what? That's exactly what the White House was talking about a year ago when it came up with its college ratings idea that, as we all know, has morphed, has morphed into a um, college uh, scorecard of sorts. Gainful employment, the new normal, and its proponents, governors, and business leaders. President Obama's carrot and stick approach, though, is the result of a growing frustration, not just about rising costs, but about the value of a college education and whether students can get it are getting their money's worth. So there's a certain logic in shifting $150 billion in annual student aid to higher rated schools based on uh, 
some kind of rating system versus the status quo. But what is the status quo? Well, to quote one critic, obsolete cost structure and governance, teaching disconnected from the real world, a reverence for tradition devoid of vision. And we all know the, 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 the line that I believe one of um, a very prominent college president came out with, which was, or a joke, how many college presidents does it take to change the light bulb? Change? Change? <laughs> Who said anything about change? So you've all embarked on an, on an interesting campaign, an important campaign, to develop what I believe you've called a new language to describe the advantages and benefits of, of a liberal arts education. So with that lengthy, maybe long-winded um, comment, let's turn now to our guests, James and Gregory, if we may be on a first-name basis. Yes. You're all testimonials for the benefits of a liberal arts education. Would either one of you care to start with what this new language is all about? James, Gregory? Um, I think that the, the, the things you just talked about are, are a function of uh, challenging economic times and disruptive technology. I mean, disruptive technology has affected every industry throughout history from the stage coast to journalism, and now it's higher education's turn. Um, I think there's some serious questions about affordability, return on investment, and things of that nature, distance learning, um, a whole bunch of interesting questions that a smart institution and a smart, smart industry such as higher education ought to engage in and be able to solve. But the value of a liberal arts education to me is just not questioned. In other words, you can't put a price on it. No, no, you cannot put a price on it. Uh, I, I don't think that you can. Uh, I don't think that you can put a price on exposure. I don't think you can put a price on experimentation. I don't think you can put a price on acquisition of, of a love for for lifelong learning. And um, it's not just about going to college to get a job. I don't think it really ever has been. Um, you know, for me, it was sort of pulling back the covers on the world. I was a uh, kid who grew up in Cleveland. I didn't know anyone who had gone to college. I didn't know anyone who had been a journalist. Uh, I didn't even know how to apply to college, and I was an honor student. Um, I like to say that I didn't choose Ohio Wesleyan. Ohio Wesleyan chose me. And uh, fortunately, uh, it did. And once I got there, uh, as Susan said, I mean, I did everything. I, I took philosophy courses, religion courses, astronomy courses, and then I bumped into someone who was a journalist who had a lot of girlfriends, and I was like, that's better than playing football. And, and I took my first journalism course. Um, it was in 1973 and 1974. I had my first internship. Richard Nixon resigned. I saw Woodward and Bernstein, and the rest is history. Let me go back to the issue of, of pricing. Um, sure, you can't put a price on a liberal arts education, certainly the kind you've described. But if you ask the average parent over a dinner table, mm -hmm. there is a price to pay. Mm -hmm. And that price, in the view of many, is exorbitant. Well, there's no question that it's exorbitant. I mean, the price, of, the cost of tuition outpaces inflation and, and in a number of other indicators. So yeah, as the guy said who was running for mayor of New York several years ago, the price of going to college is too damn high. OK, I get that. I, I, I do get that. Uh, the fact that we're in a challenging global environment where, you know, it's super competitive, other countries want what we have. I mean, maybe there should be some kind of tax credit for, you know, paying tuition to go to, you know, Harvard or Ohio Wesleyan or Colby College or, or something like that. It is true that it is very, very expensive. And when things cost a lot, a lot of tough choices have to get made. But not going to college should not be one of them. James, um, is it fair to say that the debate over the cost of higher education, access, affordability, is the tail wagging the dog in liberal arts colleges? In liberal arts colleges, yeah, I think it is. I mean, it, it's far different from us talking about for-profit colleges and other kinds of uh, uh, options. But um, 
you know, I, I think that we have to recognize a number of things. One is that uh, we are driving up the cost of higher education, that is, we consumers, because we're demanding so much of higher education. We're demanding rock climbing walls. We're demanding, you know, exorbitant or rather elaborate uh, housing uh, for our students. I, I went to Willamette University, and I'm happy to see that Steve Thorsett, our president, is here today. In 1969, having never heard of it before I went, and never having visited it before I went, never having heard of it before I applied, and uh, it then had almost nothing, but it had everything you needed. And what you needed were good teachers, teachers who cared deeply about teaching and about their students, and who were inspiring, and, and with whom I, and whose memory I carry with me uh, even to, to today. So, uh, you know, it, it depends on what one needs, uh, what one wants, what one looks for in college education. And it really is about, uh, as a teacher of mine, Bill Braden, no longer living, but was a great professor of English at uh, Willamette, said, you know, he could teach under a tree. I mean, that's what his job was to do. And it was to, to light the fire in the minds of the, pe the students that he had. That doesn't cost very much. But it's we who are demanding of our colleges that they provide more than is necessary for a good and polished education. I want to say one other thing. The context in which we're considering um, the cost of education today and the, the kind of sacrifices families have to make for their children, um, you know, that's not new. That, uh, my, my, my father uh, went to college, started in 1938 at Duquesne University. It wasn't a good time to start college. Goes into the military, World War I, interrupted college education, comes back out, goes to St. Louis University in the GI Bill, uh, gets a degree in commerce. My mother never goes to college. 25 years later, uh, I come along and they take a flyer with me. They take a flyer to send me to a college they had never heard of uh, to pay the cost, whatever it was then, uh, for, for, to send me to college, uh, to come out as a history major, which made probably little sense to them, but they took the risk on their kid and I'll, never, you know, I'll always be grateful to them for it. I want to ask you about the demographic shifts um, in this country that uh, I often find surprising that they're not more or a greater part of the analysis of certainly what's going on with liberal arts colleges. Um, we've seen an aging of the average student, which is now, on average, older than 25 years old on most campuses. And there's also the demographic shift as we see it in race and ethnicity. And kids, first generation often, uh, students who are making it to some of your institutions. And it's you know, based on the data that I was given and, and that I saw, it was, again, it was eye-opening that you tend to have certainly largest percentages of minority students than the typical four-year public institution. Here's my question, though. How are we ignoring at your peril the importance of that shift? And it's, you talk about consumers. The importance of the demand that they're placing on liberal arts education. Um, not just for the sake of education, but people who are often in their second or third career and want a whole new opportunity and see your institutions as the key to their success down the road. I mean, this is a very different kind of student that is placing these demands on liberal arts colleges as they are at four-year public and private institutions. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer the question. Um, uh, I, I do think there's a cost associated with bringing people together in intimate ways um, because you know, it's, it's, it's investing in building community among, among people. And a liberal arts education, liberal arts college itself is an intimate setting in which people from diverse backgrounds can come together and, and build relations between them. You don't need to do that, in a, or you can't, or it's difficult to do that in a, in a large research university because you don't have those intimate settings for, for individuals. So if there's a cost to that, it's a cost that is an investment well, well worth making. I, and I guess more to the point, and I'm, I'll use Bates College as an example. Bates Colleges offers folks, uh, or new students, um, essentially finances 90% of need. But for many of the students that they want to recruit, the 10% that they're asking families to pay is too much. And I, I guess it brings us back to the issue of affordability and how diversity and affordability often clash. Greg? Uh, I, I don't want to be the skunk at the garden party, but I mean, <laughs> if, if, if a college is offering 90% and you can't afford the 10, then you, shouldn't, you can't go there. I mean, that's what I tell kids. It's like, um, sometimes you can't afford to go to Harvard, or sometimes you can't afford to go to Bates or Ohio Wesleyan. There are a lot of good colleges, though, and some of them are community colleges, some of them are 
there are a lot of really good colleges that you can't afford. But if you're getting 90% in aid and you can't afford the 10%, you, you can't go to that one. You just can't go to that one. And I think it's okay to say that. I don't think that that means that that's a bad college. I don't think that that means that uh, oh, we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm just saying that you know you got to be able to do what you can do, and you got to look. But if you search, just like in any other endeavor, there are great bargains out there, and they're they're not all Ohio Wesleyan, not all, not all Bates, they're not all Miami. Um, some of them are Cleveland State University. Some of them are a, a wide range of schools that offer committed teachers a great menu uh, to, to uh, choose from and disciplines and um, you know uh, where you can still acquire the same things I did at Ohio Wesleyan uh, life a lifelong uh, love of learning um, lifelong relationships um, they're good people good teachers and good opportunities how much about what we're talking about here in the larger picture uh, has to do with um, an identity crisis for uh, for liberal arts colleges Brett or Yes. Now, I don't know if the crisis is in the college itself or the, the, the colleges themselves, uh, but rather in, um, in, in society. Uh, and, and I think it's a false crisis. I'm not to, it's not to say that there aren't sincere um, issues that are uh, sincere, you know, parents are wrestling with difficult issues and, and making sincere choices for their children. Uh, but uh, there, there's a sense of panic. I mean, this is, as I said before, this is not new uh, in the history of our nation, in the history of education in our nation. Uh, there are there are first generation there have been first generation parents uh, first gener generation students um, you know multiple times in cycles over the course of uh, the couple hundred years in, in which the colleges have been so active so um, so I think that it's just, it's an unnecessary panic there's a, there's, a, there's a and it comes from leadership at the top so we can have the president of the United States denigrate an art history major if he wants to do so as he has done uh, I, I want to say that he and Michelle Obama. I had their first date at the Art Institute of Chicago, so the arts did provide him some background <laughs> for success. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it, it comes from the top. It comes from some, it comes from leadership. And uh, Senator Collins was an extraordinarily inspiring leader this morning. And if we could have that kind of voice, then we can overcome some of these kind of fears and, and concerns that people do have. Right? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say I, I participated in uh, some strategic work with some colleges, sort of looking at what the challenges were, you know, that they faced. And I think one of the reasons they wanted me involved was, you know, I'm in the newspaper industry where we faced all kinds of challenges, had our heads very deep in the sand. And one of the things that was interesting is um, hearing some of the same, because there were professors and deans and students and all kinds of people in this group, and they sounded so much like journalists back in 1990. Like, when you talk about tenure, it's like, oh, I can't talk about that. I mean, that's, you know, it's about quality. Like, if you want to change curriculum, if you want to change, you know, sort of how we do things, it means that we, you know, we don't care about tradition and stuff like that. And, and I was like, gee, I heard all this before. So I do think that there are real challenges from um, these virtual colleges, these, these folks that have figured out a way for you to have access to the best professors while you're sitting in your, in your study at home. Like you can actually be taught by somebody at Harvard or somebody at um, you know, Ohio Wesleyan or what have you. And that, that's a real challenge, okay? It's a real challenge to liberal arts colleges, colleges you know, of any stripe. And if the leadership, as Susan said, it was a joke, how many, how many professors or college presidents does it take to change a life up? You gotta embrace change. You gotta figure out a way to deliver that product in ways in which people want to receive it, when they want to receive it. And um, that, I think, maintains the value, uh, but it also recognizes the changing uh, demographics, technology, and economics. And, and ignoring that um, you know, is perilous. And, and I'm here to tell you, as a member of the Fourth Estate, uh, there's, a, there's a real cost. There's a real cost to that. And um, beware. I guess what I meant by identity crisis, it was, uh, I was reading um, in the New York Times a Q&A with former president of Kalamazoo College who said, we are very close to becoming or thinking that higher education should become uh, trade schools, that our colleges should become trade schools. I mean, that's a pretty extreme view, I think. Um, but is there any truth to it? I mean, yeah, we just talked about this. It, it is, there are people out there who say, if I'm going to pay $25,000 in tuition 
to send my kid to a school, I expect when they come out to get a job. I mean, that's really what they're talking about. It's like, um, you know, if I, 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 want, I want that kid to, 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 to come out and, and get a job and be able to pay off those loans right away. And if you can't deliver that, then uh, I think that was a waste of money. I think it was a waste of time. And why, I'm, uh, why am I up to my eyeballs in debt? That's basically a trade school. You know, you go to school to become a mechanic, you get out, and you go work on cars. And that's what people uh, are increasingly sort of thinking when they think about the value proposition. I do believe that the leaders in higher education and those of us who have benefited from liberal arts education, we need to fight back on that and just say, there's never been that kind of direct relationship when you look at the value proposition of going to a good liberal arts school. There's no price that you can put on the ability to think. <laughs> there just isn't. Okay. Yeah, just to say, I think it's, a, it's a, a common but a false dichotomy to oppose the trade school with liberal arts of education. And, and I think the president in this case was absolutely right in saying that not everyone had to go to a four-year college, that in fact we ought to invest in trade schools, we ought to be able to provide people that kind of alternative. Uh, it, is, it isn't for everyone and, and, and they're not in direct competition. They offer different uh, qualities and, and different uh, values and different services and uh, they should be supported for that. I mean, it, the same people who are concerned about the cost of a of a, of a, a four-year college uh, are willing to spend, let's say, $40,000 on a car that's going to lose most of its value in the first three or four years, whereas in the college, it's precisely the opposite. You're investing in some of money that's going to have value over the course of a lifetime. The CIC data that uh, I've seen says that 89% of uh, liberal arts college graduates um, get a job within six months or by six months. I mean, to me, it sounds like there's an untold story there. That again, getting back to the issue of you know, perception is reality, why has it been so difficult for liberal arts colleges to tell their story if it's if it's relatively successful in terms of all these concerns that the public is expressing? What where is the bottleneck? Where is the problem in communicating not just this data, but the reaffirmation that a liberal arts education can not just get you a job, but make you a better person? Why is that message getting lost? I wonder if it is, if it is getting lost. I mean, uh, there are these great institutions represented in this room today and in, the, in this uh, organization. And uh, are, they are receiving more applications than they can offer, offer uh, seats to. You know? So they're, they're turning down students who are applying. So there's a greater supply than there is a, 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 a need for that supply or ability to meet that supply. So it seems to me that it's not necessarily uh, the uh, crisis that, when we're, we're, that the newspapers or the public radio might be articulating that there is. Uh, and, and I think we have, to, we have to be a little more confident in what, this, what it is, the, the contributions that liberal arts and colleges make to the health of the nation. And Senator Collins, again, we should send her on the road. I mean, she was fantastic this morning. Mm. Yeah, and I um, also think, um, you know, you sort of focus on what you measure. You know, so much of, you know, the value of higher education is sort of dictated by U.S. News and World Report and other kind of rankings. And, and those, the kinds of things you're just talking about, aren't really part of that equation. Um, you know, I think a lot of liberal arts schools, by the very nature, are kind of small. I think the people who are interested in them are, you know, a subset of the population. Those folks, as he's saying, they find their way to these great liberal arts colleges. They understand what happens at the end of that process. Other folks uh, out there, the vast majority, are sort of saying, look, for this money, what do I get? And um, that, that makes it hard for any kind of message, like the one you're talking about, to get through when people are so focused on such a limited subset of data. We're gonna move uh, to questions. Maury, how much time do we have? We got, I know James has a, a plane to catch, but we have like another 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Well, uh, I'd like to see a show of hands and well, we wait for a question. You know, I have to, I have to um, mention this. When we were covering, when NPR was covering the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement, I remember running repeatedly into liberal arts college graduates with degrees in philosophy and in humanities. And I remember asking them, you know, and they'd say to me, look, I'm out here because I think there are problems in this country. But I would ask them, well, have you looked for a job? Have you found a job? Uh, no. And it would often boil down to, 
there are no jobs for humanities majors. So I'm thinking about law school. Well, I mean, to me, you know, it's a personal choice you make, but you have to live with that choice. And I was just struck by how many of these young people I ran into with terrific, bright young people, but with little or no rudder to steer them yeah. into the kind of jobs that I'm sure that they were, um, that they were searching for. Any wanna, questions out yeah, there? Uh, before <clears throat> we start, I just want to take a little moderated privilege and ask one question, because I was struck by the title of this conversation, which is expire, Inspiring Excellence in the Arts not expire, and Media. Not expire. Not expire, no. <laughs> Excellence has been expiring, but that's for another day. Um, <laughs> no. I, I want to know, as somebody who's in both the arts and media, what your experiences, what, what your liberal arts experiences Somebody, I actually got a job one time because they were describing the head of an organization. They said, a lot of people know the difference between bad and good. This guy knows the difference between good and great. What was it about your liberal arts experience that in each of your careers made you able to know what excellence was and strive for it and, I think, attain it? Well, there's, there's a lot, I think. But I, I would just point to one thing, and I mentioned it a bit earlier. I think in terms of the relations one builds with teachers, and one carries for the rest of one's life. And um, I mean, I had my, my greatest influence, besides my high school football coach, uh, were the teachers I had in college. And you know, Tom Brzezinski, Bill Braden, Bill Duvall, George McCowan, Roger Hull. I mean, these are people 45 years ago, someone no longer living, that I can tell you, I mean, they're with me every day. And, if I, and I've taught at large research universities, and I know that's very, very difficult. That kind of relationship is very difficult to, to build and sustain over the course of time. But it's something that one carries always and expects uh, from a liberal arts education. Yeah. Um, I, I just learned to appreciate a great teacher. My um, history professor uh, was a great, he could teach anything. I mean, earlier American history, colonial history, whatever. He could, he could do it all. But he always started out class by challenging any of us, say, to do baseball history. I just, I didn't like baseball. I grew up in Cleveland. They were losers. <laughs> so, so I could never, you know, get any extra points. But he would start out by saying, you know, can anybody name the starting a lineup for the 1971 Cincinnati Reds or something like that? I can. Yeah, you can do that. And, and, but then, you know, he was a great history teacher. And what he did was he brought it to life for me, like even today. Somebody will ask me, like, uh, what was Ruth for B. Hayes' wife's name? And I'll, I'll go, Lemonade Lucy, <laughs> because she was the first one to serve lemonade in the White House. I know that because he taught me that. When I read history, I'm looking for those kind of details, okay? In fact, in, in anything that I do, it's, it's the details that make a story a great story. I learned that from him. Uh, you know, my, my journalism professor was a fascinating guy. I mean, he just died uh, maybe a, a year ago. I went to his uh, funeral, and I, I did a testimonial for him, and I was in touch with him until the day he died. But he was a, an amazing guy. What he taught me was, you know what? If we have an appointment at 10 o'clock, you better be here at 10 o'clock. If you're here at 10 on 1, 10 on 2, you're gonna have to wait 25, 30 minutes because I'm busy. Yeah. And I, you know, I learned to be punctual. I learned to be demanding. I also learned how to, to admit mistakes, uh, have the highest standards when it comes to ethics. I learned that from Burn Edwards. So you know, I carry that with me in uh, everything I do, but particularly in my work. Here's my two cents worth on this via my daughter's own experience. Uh, I said, what has changed you at, at, at Bates? And she said, I'm more confident. Mm. And then she said, and when I get on her case about She's an environmental sciences major. And I say, you know, have you looked into job opportunities? And she says, Dad, it's not just finding a job. It's finding a passion. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't put it more simply. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, anyway. There's data behind that in George's uh, essay, too. So, uh, thank, thank you all three for that. Questions, especially about the event. Yes, sir. Go ahead and hold on. There's a microphone in which you'll have to speak. Uh, so both our panelists are high achievers. And I'm sorry, tell us who you are. Uh, I'm George Anders. I write for Forbes. Um, both our panelists are high achievers. who have done a lot of hiring of people in their own right. Tell us a little how often you'll hire a liberal arts graduate with an impractical nature and how that works out and why you want such people on your team. Like I'm in the liberal arts business. I mean, <laughs> these are the people I hire. I mean, uh, and e even even our CFO, you know, got a degree in in in, in music. Um, so. 
you, you hire people who are, who are responsible, who are, are, ta are talented, who are um, uh, um, energetic, uh, who, are, who are collegial, uh, who are willing to make sacrifices, uh, and, and who know something about what it is they do. And they've, uh, they've come to know something about what it is they do by having done it for some time, not because necessarily they learned what it is they do now. And we were talking last night at dinner that some of, us, some of our, our younger colleagues here uh, could, not have taken in, uh, could not have taken classes in college to prepare them for what they're doing now because what they do now didn't exist in college. And that's going to happen more and more as time goes on. Yeah, yeah and, and it's not that I'm looking for somebody who's gone to a liberal arts school, but we do have a lot of them um, there. Our critics say, leave the, the arts out. They're just liberal, you know, at the newspaper. <laughs> but, uh, but what we end up doing is picking people that have dabbled in a lot of different disciplines, because in journalism, you need to be able to learn a lot about a lot of different things very quickly. But then what you also find is that, you know, they've been in environments where they've been encouraged to create and lead things. So they create clubs, mountain climbing clubs, and other special interest clubs. And they had a chance at, at, at these smaller institutions in particular to be the captain of the soccer team and things of that nature. So you, you end up finding people who are broad, who are curious about a lot of different things, who've had opportunities to create things and lead things, and that, uh, to me, is a recipe for a very successful journalist. Okay. Other questions? Something on the other side, maybe? Anybody? Yeah. Or, yeah, here, where? No questions for these accomplishments? Hi. Uh, oh, thank here. you for your remarks. Uh, I'm Carol Schneider. I'm a, pre a graduate of Mount Holyoke College, and I'm president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And I actually didn't want to ask a question. I wanted to offer another answer to uh, your question, Claudia, why isn't the story getting told? And I think part of it is that those of us who are devoted to the value of liberalized colleges and liberal education are of a certain age. And in fact, there's a very important set of changes going on on our liberal arts college campuses, and that story is not getting told. And it speaks directly to your experience interviewing people in Occupy Wall Street. My alma mater, I'll just illustrate it with, with their experience, has created a required paid internship or a supported research experience for every undergraduate. And they don't just send them out there to do a project to make that real world connection. They basically now have a staged planning through the curriculum. Think about that, that search for passion. What do you think it's going to be? Uh, how do we get ready and courses for what you're going to be doing in your project? And then there's a, a, a college-wide symposium called the LEAP Symposium that, in which everybody shares what they've actually learned from trying to connect their learning with real world projects. There are a lot of such exciting innovations going on, and there are more of them in liberal arts colleges than anywhere else because at scale they can do them. This is a story that could be told, and I'd love to see it told. I agree. Um, remember, though, that we're at a time when politics is striving so much of, of, of higher ed. From the president's, um, the White House initiative on transparency and so forth on down. And I think that is largely responsible for some of the negative coverage of uh, higher ed. Uh, a terrific higher ed reporter that's in the room, Scott Jasek, might back me up on that. Um, there is a sense of perception that there is a crisis afoot that, again, as I had said in my introductory remarks, you know, that higher education in general is in trouble. And, 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 and but it gets back to my point about how often I do not hear from colleges saying, hey, I've got a story to tell. I mean, the requirement you just talked about, I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. Give me a call. Um, anyway, we, uh, any, any comment based on, on, on that criticism that me, maybe the media is missing the story? Gregory, James? Well, I mean, I, I, I think um, the, the media, um, is probably fanning the flames of a story rather than creating the story, which is to say that there are legitimate concerns. But uh, the sense of panic um, is is probably exaggerated. But there are legitimate concerns. I mean, it's it's you know just like reminded by the debates last night. You know that that there are, whatever there were twelve people on the stage, not each one pandering to our baser instincts, but a number of them pandering to our basic instincts. That becomes the headline of the stories. Because that sells papers, or that attracts attention, whatever it does, or that you know it 
fuels the the the, the uh, journalistic uh, imp uh, impulse, whatever it might be. But that's not the total story, but that is a part of the story. So there's a legitimate part of the story that is the, the one that you're raising, but it's not the whole story. Oh, everybody always blames the media. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the media today is so decentralized now. I mean, anybody that has a blog post or whatever, they can, I mean, media is as broad and uh, decentralized as it's ever been in history. So. When, when, when I hear the word media, I just go like, that is such a 1970s term. I mean, it's just, it's just an old way of thinking about things. I, I think what, 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 what's left of mainstream media focuses where the money is, and that's really the, the whole dramatic change in legislatures defunding higher education just in general. So they tend to spend time on that land grant type stuff. I, I get that. And then, then it tends to spend time on issues like you know, sexual violence on campus and affordability and things of that nature. And there's very little room to tell some really nice, touchy-filly story about, you know, what the graduation rate is at, you know, Cornell or whatever. I mean, it's just, that's your job. I mean, I think you got to be aggressive out there. You got to figure out where those markets are. You got to get to those high schools and tell your story. Tell your story. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> expecting the media, whatever is left of that, uh, to, to be in that sort of PR mode is just not realistic with the serious challenges facing higher education On today. a scale of 1 to 10, Greg, how did your uh, news organization cover higher ed, with one being really bad? Three, four. Wow. Really? <clears throat> well, we used to be a 10, but, um, you know, we're 50% smaller than what we were just seven years ago. There are a lot of things that we don't do. I can't even count. Uh, the things that we don't cover um, uh, the way we did. We used to have four people, three people covering higher education. Um, now we have a half a person doing that. So just to be honest, um, I'm not happy, but you know, there's a priority list of things where we can have impact with the limited resources that we have uh, now, and you know, we're not doing well there. Three is probably generous. There's a question up. There's a question up here, and I don't know if there was before a we do. I, I have one response because it does come from the arts, and it's a it's a story. I've not seen this story told in, as a liberal arts story. There's a the, by far the biggest event uh, in the Broadway theater in the last ten, maybe twenty years is the musical Hamilton um, by Lin Manuel Miranda. Lin, um, whom I know, who's a, a young friend. What kind of person? takes a biography of Alexander Hamilton and on page, by page 50 says, oh my God, this guy's a hip hop hero. He's like, he's, he's, he's like Tupac, he's like Biggie Smalls. And proceeds to write a hip hop musical about Alexander Hamilton uh, that portends a real revolution in American musical theater. It's an incredible show, go see the show. Um, who does that? A kid who went to Wesleyan University and, you know, and who, who took all kinds of classes and did all kinds of things. And so the question of, and yes. That, and that, that almost uh, won a Pulitzer Prize, so go yeah. figure. We, no, we almost. It's still eligible. It's going to win a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> yes, Isaac. Yeah, identify yourself. Thank you. Isaac Holman. I'm a Lewis and Clark grad. Um, James, you've made a few comments that, um, if I might take the liberty to paraphrase, seem a little bit to say that the crisis isn't within the liberal arts colleges. It's without it's from outside and in how they're being perceived. Um, and it reminded me of a, an earlier election cycle when Sarah Palin um, was criticizing you know, these big government spending programs and all this useless uh, research on fruit flies in Paris, France. Um, and Jon Stewart came out you know, very quickly and, and said, oh great, you know, fruit flies. Here are all the things we've learned from fruit flies. It turns out it's a model organism in genetics and things related to autism and, and a whole bunch of different disorders that are of incredible importance um, for our, our everyday lives. Um, and so there's a, you know, he does a very good job or has done a very good job of um, calling out these anti-intellectual currents that are, that are afoot in a lot of American society. And so to, to circle this back to some of your comments about the media, what the media, and, and you know, universities can be players in that too. I'm curious if you have thoughts about the role that liberal arts colleges play, not exclusive in the sense of 
only accepting you know high society people, but exclusive in the sense of being intimate, small environments. What can liberal arts colleges do to raise the intellectual tone of the, the broader society? Well, um, uh, uh, two things. I'll uh, 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 comment and an maybe a proposed answer to your question. I think Greg's point was quite right. I mean, what, what the liberal arts college is offering that others can't offer um, is, an ex the, is the opportunity to, to in encourage an experiment in communal living. I mean, the, the sense of having to, having to cre create a community. Every, every, every year, a quarter of the population comes into a liberal arts college, and that can infect a, you know, that culture. Uh, remarkably, and it, 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 and and it will, and these people come together, and they they form groups, and they have clubs, and they produce newspapers, and they do theater, and they do all this, and and they they build these kinds of relationships. And if you go to a thirty or fifty thousand student university, you can't easily do that. It must be very very difficult. So I think that that that's a, that's a that's a that's a value uh, on which one can, in terms of how the kind of education and the kind of growth in an individual, that's a value that one can't put. A dollar figure on, so that might be one aspect of it. And having said that, I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> about how, um, how people affiliated with colleges tend to be more open-minded, and they tend to be more open-minded. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Susan Collins is doing it. I mean, you know. So what can I say? I, I think people are doing it. Uh, it's just a matter of, and and here's the media, and it's the, and it's, and it's a perfect thing because because Greg is right. I mean, the media is so diverse, and you have little control over what is being put out there. You can put out the most deliberate press coverage in the, in the in, 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 you know, in your newspaper, and it's going to be just beaten up by all these tweets and all these websites and all these rants and all this stuff. So you've got less and less control over what it was you had control of 30, 50 years ago, whatever it might be. So it's really, really hard, and you can't ask much, I mean too much, of the liberal arts education in this regard. Um, you know, they can only do as much as they can do. Yeah, just to add to that, because I, I think that's, that's really the point is, uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, keep um, inviting a very geographically, economically, racially diverse uh, classes on your campus, because it's those little ripples that go out into the world, and some of them become, you know, bloggers who found, you know, billion dollar companies, right? So, and those people will tell your story, okay? They're not shy about saying, I found my way at Kobe College. They're not shy about saying those kinds of things. And those are the best evangelists that you can have. You know, we do live in an anti-intellectual, a growing anti-intellectual environment, anti-fact environment. But, you know, creating people who know how to think, uh, who know how to sort of, you know, separate the, the wheat from the chaff is a very important thing to be able to do. And it's increasingly important in the digital age where there's so much stuff out there that's not factual, that's not true, that's not rigorous. And um, you know, that's what, that's what you get at a liberal arts school, and that's particularly what you get in a small, intimate environment where you can create organizations, you can be a leader, you can interface with the administration, you can argue, you can protest, and you can still get an A. That's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, so, so I think that's what you really want to preserve. Um, that's what I really loved about um, Ohio Wesleyan, and I could not have ever um, done what I've done if I had gone to Ohio State. I mean, I went to visit Ohio State, and the McDonald's was underground, and I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> uh, you know. And I went to. A, I was. A, I was really interested in chemistry, so I went to audit a chemistry class, and they were like a thousand people in it, and the guy was on television. I was like, I can't learn from a guy that's on television. When I raise my hand, I can't get called on. There is a flip side uh, to, I think, your, your suggestion that Senator Collins herself brought up, and that is that uh, this environment of incivility that she has fought in the Senate, I mean, CIC puts out the data that 90% of US senators uh, had a liberal arts education. Although I'm still wondering why you would want to make that claim. <laughs> um, notwithstanding uh, Senator Collins' efforts. Um, but you know, this, this question that she brought up about intolerance on campuses, I mean, that's a really serious question. If on your campuses there is a degree of incivility or lack of openness and open-mindedness, then you, know, you can't go out and preach that society should, should do something different. Um, 
So I don't know if we're caught up in just a moment in time in our history where intolerance has really ruled the, the, or, or at least tainted the conversation, but clearly um, we are um, in, in the midst of an enormous amount of angst about our future. And you know, liberal arts colleges, for all its merits, um, may not be in a position to change that. I don't know. Well, maybe we have, there's we have time for one more question, but actually, Greg, you gave me the key, maybe the answer to Claudio's original question about the people in the Occupy movement. It may not be that a liberal arts degree makes it harder for you to get a job. It may be that a greater proportion of activists are liberal arts graduates. That may be because of the environment. Yes, please identify yourself. Hello, I'm Jane Wood. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Westminster College. And I have a question for all the panels, but in particular for Mr. Moore. Many of us here are trying to lead changes within our institutions to address some of the realities of higher education. And so I'm very interested in how you helped your organization from within to adapt to the changing reality. In essence, sometimes we come from institutions that are very steeped in tradition, that indeed the resistance to change is part of the tradition. So how do you help, how have you helped um, your organization move forward in that way? Wow, that's a really great question. And I'm glad you're assuming that I did that. Uh, no. Well, the fact that I'm still here, I think, is evidence of that. Um, you know, I, I, I believe in change. I think you have to sort of accept um, that change is inevitable, right? And then um, create a learning environment for change. Like, like, what I find is that most people who continue to work at the Post, where I am right now, are people who are deeply committed to journalism. And they want to learn new things. They want to be able to survive on the other side. They want to get to the other side of the river. And so they, they want to learn if they can overcome their anxiety. Um, I, I, so we, we create sort of, uh, we have what we call Denver Post U. And we try to teach people all the digital tools uh, and, and, and change techniques that we're going to be judging them on. That's what we try to do. Um, you know, we don't, you know, I try not to be, uh, I try not to use scare language. I think how we talk about change is really important. Uh, so the kinds of things that I've done is, you know, I go to our training sessions. I actually sit in there. Um, you know, so I think you have to be there if you want to sort of lead that kind of transition. Um, and here's the most important thing. Um, Ten years ago, when a 21-year-old would come to interview with me and say they want a job, and I would go, hey, yeah, kid. Why don't you go somewhere, work for 10 years, and then come back and see me? Well, now we hire 21, 22-year-olds. But not only do we hire them, we let them run things. We, we let them lead the, the transformation. And it's done wonderful things for us. I mean, one of the reasons that we won the Pulitzer Prize for the coverage of the tragic Aurora theater shooting was our performance on digital. So the shooting happens at 12.37 in the morning uh, on a Friday morning. The paper is already put to bed. The paper that lands on your doorstep at 6 o'clock had no mention of the shooting in it. Uh, the next paper that landed on your doorstep was 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. So from 12.37 a.m. Friday until 6 a.m., we covered that story, social media, other digital platforms, and that's why, that's why we want it. So um, you know, let, let, let the natives, the young natives, play a role in your organization about you know, how do you spread the word, how do you explain the value of higher education? How do you communicate with them on you know, different platforms? I think that's one of the ways to sort of accelerate change. Thank you so much. It, I know there are other questions, so I'm feeling dreadfully guilty. But uh, we have to move on. As you may have seen earlier on the screen, it told us that our batteries were running to 10%, so we need a coffee break. Um, but I do want to thank, oh, you were going to say something. Uh, one last thing. I started out with, uh, with headlines. Here's one final one. Liberal arts degrees, text hot ticket. <laughs> I don't remember where I got that, but wow. it's a real head. <laughs> Just to end on an update. Well, thank thing. you. I want to thank, again, Claudio Sanchez, James Bruno, Gregory Moore. Thanks so much.